find out. Well, trauma is defined as the lasting emotional response that often results from living through a distressing event. And all of us here have experienced trauma at some time in our life. For some of us, it started very young in our home that had alcoholism or maybe some kind of abuse in it. Some were bullied when we were young. Other people had, we had someone break up with us that we were dating. Some here have been diagnosed with cancer. Some of you have been the victim of a sexual assault at some time in your life. Others have gone through a divorce. Some of you felt like you lost half of your retirement savings during the recession. And all of us have had death of loved ones. And that's trauma. Well, then there is what they call mass or collective trauma, which is the psychological effects of a terrible event that impacts a large group of people, like those who went through the Great Depression or the Holocaust or the Oklahoma City bombing or the attacks of 9-11. Well, finally, there's what they call global trauma. And about this time three years ago, we were all in the dark. No way of knowing that normal life, life as we had known it, was going to come to a grinding halt. And now we refer to it in, with the post-apocalyptic sounding term, the pandemic. And this will go down as the most traumatic collective event of our lifetime. At least let's hope that that was the worst collective event of our lifetime. Some of you can remember back to the innocent days of February 2020 when we thought the pandemic would be over in like a month or two. But before long, we began to witness things that seemed like straight out of science fiction. People walking around in hazmat suits and gas masks. The streets of our largest cities empty and quiet. Hospitals flooded to overflowing with dying people. Even rows and rows of refrigerator trucks sitting outside of hospitals to hold all the bodies. Something we never thought we'd see in our country, people just being buried in mass graves. All of us witnessed firsthand stores, shelves that were empty. We had government-mandated vaccines, and in all likelihood, the future generations will have a, a line of demarcation between before the pandemic and after the pandemic. That's going to be one of the marks of our time in history. The American Psychological Association says that over 80% of people are experiencing a significant increase in anxiety and depression due to the pandemic. My question is, who are those 20% who have not experienced <laughs> heightened anxiety and depression? You know, is that possible? However, that's not all that's happened over these past three years. There was also the death of George Floyd and others resulting in the uprising of the Black Lives Movement, many protests, a few that turned into rioting, and it seemed to me like it was the 1960s all over again 50 years later. There, of course, has been uproar and chaos in our schools over transgender bathrooms, the battle between who should decide between parents and the school boards of what should be taught, children falling behind maybe a year or two because schools have been closed during COVID. Then there was the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, and dissenting views about sending billions in aid over there while we still have so much poverty and homelessness here. And then there's China. I mean, did they create and unleash this virus on the world to create just the kind of problems that have happened? Are they interfering in our elections? And how come so many of our politicians are taking massive amounts of money from the Chinese? Well, there's even been more over the past three years. 22 million Americans lost their jobs in the early months of the pandemic, leaving literally millions and millions of families unable to pay their mortgages or their rent. Then inflation began to rise and rise and rise, gas over $7 a gallon, groceries up, literally everything up. People also seem to forget how to be civil in public, as shoving matches and physical confrontations filled subways, airplanes, and school board meetings. If that wasn't enough, some mayors and governors decided that there were certain laws they disagreed with, they disapproved of, and so they were no longer going to enforce those. So smash and grab crimes became commonplace. If your car got jacked, don't bother calling the police in those cities because they're not coming. And those kinds of cities had literally hundreds of thousands of people who are moving away over these past three years. You know, that's all happened just during the pandemic. And did I forget to mention that suicide rates in the U.S., 
are up to an all-time high, and especially for younger people. Fentanyl is now killing over 75,000 people a year in our country. Also, the largest and most influential tech companies like Google, Twitter, and Facebook have been caught using misinformation to influence elections, suppressing views they disagree with, and even something I thought I would never see. The FBI, the Department of Justice, have been exposed for pursuing and investigating people who they disagree with politically. So let's see. The pandemic, racial problems, gender-related free-for-all, war in Ukraine by Russia, the Chinese, you can't believe anything they say anymore, Americans losing their job, inflation driving prices higher and higher, mass shootings happening weekly, criminals running wild, anxiety, depression, and suicide on the rise, 175,000 homeless people in California alone. You can't trust major tech companies. You can't trust the media to provide fair and balanced news. And oh, one more thing, Lincoln Riley ran off to California <laughs> with our Heisman Trophy winner, leaving us to go six and seven, so there's that too. Well, today my talk is entitled, Overcoming the Pandemic Blues. And I have five points, five recommendations for you. Number one, acknowledge that all this has probably had a negative effect on you. The experts say that the time frame for recovering from really serious trauma is not days, it's not weeks, it's not months, it's years. And if you're in denial, it may take decades. In John 16, verse 33, Jesus reminds us, in this world, you will have tribulations, you will have troubles. And a part of these troubles, like the pandemic and other things I've mentioned, they just kind of produce a destabilizing effect on us. They create a feeling of uncertainty about life and about the future. Now, some people are like, like man, I'm just ready to move on. Forget all this craziness. If only it were that easy. However, traumatic events sometimes cause PTSD, usually thought of effects on military veterans. It can also impact people who suffer from other forms of trauma. And there can be all kinds of fallout from this. Intrusive memories, avoidance behaviors, mood destabilizing. And I'll bet that some of you have either had conflict with or maybe even lost a relationship with a friend or a family member during the COVID time because of disagreements on how things should be handled. You know, Jana and I had uh, some friends on Facebook, friends that we have, and bet on Facebook. They were very adamant that everyone must wear a mask everywhere they go. In fact, for months, it was frowned upon if anyone left their house. And if they found out someone was out in public with, without wearing a mask, they would just put on there, well, I guess you just don't care how many people you kill. And as you know, being under someone's scrutiny and, and judgment and condemnation can be pretty, pretty draining. On the other hand, maybe you were some of the people that were frustrated with those who do, you didn't think took the pandemic as seriously as you thought they should, and, and there was frustration over that. Most people said that during the pandemic, they experienced an increasing sense of fear and vulnerability. People reported feeling a loss of faith in life itself, that they could depend or count on anything in the future. One time the great apostle Paul made an, an amazing confession. He said, we do not want you to be informed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death, but this happened so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. And did you notice the phrase, far beyond our ability, you know, to endure? And then so much so that we despaired of life itself. Have you ever despaired of life itself? That is, wished that you could just somehow, you know, die and just be out of here? Just escape your pain and your grief and your misery. You wanted it so bad that death seemed like the best alternative to you. Many, if not most of us, have actually felt that at one time or another. And the great apostle Paul did. You know, Paul didn't paste on a happy face and tell everyone, I'm claiming the victory. No, he wrote, it was so bad 
It was actually more than I could bear. Death seemed like the only way to escape my pain. So don't ever buy the theology that says if you just have enough faith, God will bless you with health and wealth and a problem-free life. Everything you touch will turn to gold. You'll never get sick, and nothing bad will ever happen to you and your family. Don't, Don't buy that. That's not what the Bible teaches, and it's not what reality teaches us. People of faith do get sick, and their kids rebel, and their finances go down the tank, and tragedy does strike. So be like Jesus and just acknowledge, yes, there will be troubles in life, some so terrible we can barely bear them. Be like Paul, who recognized there will be hardship, some of which seems beyond our capacity to endure. So if, when you find yourself feeling anxious, grieving, irritable, uncertain, sad, there's a reason for that. You have been through a lot over the past three years. Remember this verse from earlier in the service? When you're broken, God can put you back together again. No, not exactly as you were before but still useful, still beautiful, still valuable. So just recognize that all of the fear and craziness and division and uncertainty of the last three years has been hard on you. That's number one. Just recognize it, and probably in ways that we don't even yet realize. Number two, turn your cares and anxieties over to God and trust Him. Something really bad something really problematic, something really troubling has happened in America during these past three years. Trust in the U.S. government is at an all-time low. In 1958, 73% of Americans said they had a high level of trust in our government. In 2022, that number is 20%. From 73% to now 20%. And a big part of that has to do with how some in our government handled things during the pandemic. Most importantly, we're finding out now, in some cases, they misled us knowingly. For instance, they promised if you get the vaccine, you can't get the virus. Now, if they had said, we believe that if you get the vaccine, you won't get the virus, that would have been different. You know, that would have been more honest. That would have been more transparent. However, when sweeping and life-changing pronouncements were made that later turned out to be unreliable, that really, really hurt their credibility at a time when credibility was really needed. You may have noticed a few months ago, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, announced that they were doing a, a complete makeover of their entire organization, which is an open admission of how badly they failed the American people at the time when things were needed the most. They did allow political agendas to influence and sometimes determine decisions. They did speak with absolute certainty on issues that they didn't and perhaps even couldn't have out all the answers for. It's okay if you can't. Just say so. Just be honest. And who knows how many years, maybe how many decades it's going to take for them to rebuild and regain the trust of the American people. I think it's going to be hard. That's another reason that it's so important for us to put our ultimate trust in God, not in humans, not in human institutions, as much as we love this country. In the little-known Old Testament book of Habakkuk, we see a person experiencing joy even under really dire circumstances. He says, I was so fearful that my lips quivered and my knees knocked, I knew disaster was imminent. However, he says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms, even though there are no grapes on the vine, even though the olive crops have failed and the fields that lie empty and the sheep and the cattle have all died. This is really bad for somebody in that day and age in the agricultural. I mean, just everything was bleak. He says, even though my circumstances look hopeless, Yet I will what? I will rejoice in the Lord. Now, how, how is that even possible? Because he's going to just bury his head in the sand? Is it because he's just going to pray away all of his problems? 
Because he's a simpleton who just doesn't know any better? No, and I think it hinges on this word sovereign. Because the sovereign Lord is my strength. And that word means possessing supreme jurisdiction and power. And that who that's what God is. He, he possesses supreme jurisdiction and power. In other words, Habakkuk could say, because my life, is in the caring and capable hands of God Almighty, that gives me the strength to trust Him, even through the darkest times. You know, even if the American government, if we could trust government officials always to do what's best for the American people and always to be honest and transparent, they're still going to make mistakes because they're human. Science isn't always exact. They don't, you know, our government doesn't have control over diseases or, or severe weather. They don't have control over other nations. Things are going to happen. And that is why your ultimate trust must be in God and God alone. He does have power. He does have authority to know all things and to do all things. So at the top of your to-do list in overcoming the pandemic, blues, one, acknowledge that the problems and events of the past three years have affected you and maybe in, even in ways that you're not yet aware of. Number two, turn your cares and worries over to God because you can trust him. Number three, be proactive, not passive, in recovering from the effects and damage of the last three years. Dr. Arthur Evans, who's the CEO of the American Psychological Association, states, Without addressing stress as a major part of a national recovery plan, we will be dealing with the mental health fallout of this pandemic for years and years to come. You know, they say one of the biggest factors uh, for having inner peace is to have a sense of certainty and control over factors that impact your life. But over these past three years, all of us have had very little certainty about what was going to happen next, and little to no control over everything that was happening around us. And like I said, it's just very destabilizing. And one way to regain some of that certainty that we all need, to be able to grasp some sense of control on at least parts of our life, is to be proactive. Rather than just reel from the negative things that happen all around you, like we have over these past few years, take some intentional steps forward. Move toward healing. Move toward recovery. In 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, the Bible says that people being must be proactive, and it uses the term make every effort. No, just sit passive and let life happen to you. Be proactive. Go see a counselor. You know, read the Bible. Return to being around more people. The things that you know are replenishing and healthy for you, pursue those things. Be purposeful about engaging in those things. All right, a fourth uh, step is this. Carefully and honestly manage the input into your head and heart. Romans 12 verse 2 reminds us, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be changed by the renewing of your mind. You know, what goes on in our mind dictates what happens in our, in our heart and in our life. Now, we are surrounded these days by influences of secularism, humanism, relativism. You don't have to make any effort at all to be exposed to those things. It is like the air we breathe in our culture. They're everywhere. However, good input, positive influences, biblical input must be sought out intentionally. And when we say carefully and honestly manage what we allow into our heart and to our uh, head, what we mean is be honest with yourself. Does spending hours and hours watching negative news on TV, is that, is that beneficial in your relationships, in your emotional life, and how you feel about other people? Is it good for you? Does it produce you know, good moods? Does it help you to treat others better? Some of us have too much of that going on into, into, fed, fed into our life. Colossians 3 verse 2 reminds us to set your minds on things above not on earthly things. Which leads us right into my fifth and final point. Remind yourself, this world is not my home. 
This is just temporary. Now, if you grew up in church, you might remember an old song by that title, This World Is Not My Home. In fact, when I was about 10 or 11 years old, on the closing night of vacation Bible school, the kids would basically do most of the Sunday night service. And we had a large church. There were probably five or 600 people there that night. And I was supposed to get up and sing with three other boys, a quartet. And we were going to sing the song, This World Is Not My Home. But I told my mother beforehand, I was feeling sick. I couldn't do it. However, she thought I was saying that just to get out of singing in front of everybody. And so she made me do it. Well, true story, we got about halfway through the song, and I threw up all over the microphone, all over the stage, everywhere. And as I was coming off the stage, I looked at my mom. She was sitting there, and I said, I told you I was sick. <laughs> but, but the words to the song go, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. That comes from Hebrews 13, 14, and a lot of other verses. Yes, it's very upsetting that Russia invaded Ukraine. And it's very depressing that inflation is out of control. And it's maddening that criminals can get away with everything. And the major tech companies are abusing their power. And gender-related issues are dividing our country. And even the FBI, you know, seems to have questionable motives sometimes. It's all frustrating, it's all maddening, it's all depressing. But remember, as a believer, you have a higher calling than just social or political issues. This world is not your permanent home. You're just passing through on your way to heaven. Now, I have something I want to show you today. I have a rope, and it's a pretty long rope. I'll show you here. It's pretty long, kind of bunched up. Should have thought of this before I got up here. <laughs> anyway, it's a really long rope, as you can tell. It's, it's very, very long, and it goes on for a long time. Now I want you to imagine that this rope, it represents eternity. All right? Now imagine it's way longer than, than what it really is. Imagine it can wrap, it's so long it can wrap all the way around the earth. That's 24,000 miles. That's a long rope. Now imagine this rope could wrap all around our solar system, which they say is about 12 trillion miles. And that represents eternity, this rope, that long, long rope. And then this blue part, this represents your lifespan in comparison to eternity, right? This, this, this is what we're living right now. I know the pandemic and all these things, they happen in just, just this little bitty part of that, of that whole thing. You know, if we can begin to see our lives from the perspective of eternity and that this is not our permanent home. This, this is our permanent home, right? This is heaven. This is heaven. It's going to go on and on and on and on forever. And sometimes if we can begin to see life in that way, it will help us to deal with the things that we're dealing with and see it as what it is. It's hard. It can be devastating, but it's temporary. In the meantime, God can put us back together. The cracks may show, you know, we're damaged. We're not destroyed. And yes, the pandemic was bad. Misinformation ran rampant. Our country was divided. Our lives were turned upside down. And in some cases, people died. Then there was racial conflict. There were school shootings. There were literally millions of illegal immigrants flooding across our southern border. There's unprecedented inflation, corrupt politicians, and, you know, biased news networks, drastic rise in homelessness, social media addiction for their young people, trust broken, all of these things. But in light of eternity, all of these problems are going to turn out to be like a blink of the eye, fleeting, and fortunately, temporary. Now, it's been a hard three years, and harder for some of us than for others because of various factors. Some here probably lost a loved one or someone you knew from COVID. 
For others, maybe it was more of an inconvenience than as catastrophic as that. But in ways small or large, in ways we may or may not be aware of it, this has been about as difficult and as confusing and as maddening a three-year period as hopefully any of us will ever live through. So number one, just acknowledge that this has probably affected me. This probably explains a little bit about some of the things that I'm feeling and some of the fears and uncertainties I have. And then turn your frustrations and cares and anxieties over to God. He's sovereign. You can trust him with your life. Be proactive. Don't be passive. Take steps toward recovering. Move away from things that are draining to you. Move toward things that are replenishing for you. Carefully and honestly consider the kind of input that you're allowing your heart and your mind to feed on. And then remind yourself, you know, this world, with all of its problems, divisions, controversies, is not my permanent home. You know, it's a beautiful world. Life can be wonderful. But in the big picture, I'm just passing through on my way to my real home in heaven one day. So those are my thoughts on overcoming the pandemic blues. Let's stand and have our closing prayer. Lord, all of us here recognize as hard as this has been for us, as we try to hang on to you and our faith and our confidence in the future and our trust in you, we can't imagine the negative impact this has had on many people who don't have you as the foundation of their life. And they're just... They're just waving out there in the breezes with every new thing that comes along, and we don't have to be like that. Lord, we pray that we would recognize that you can, you know, fix the brokenhearted, and you can heal us, and you can help us to have a sense of certainty and confidence and control, and that our future, our eternity is set, and this life really is going to prove to be very fleeting in light of that. Lord, we pray for healing and wholeness for people here who are still struggling with loss, with things that have happened during this time, with fears, with frustrations, with anxiety, with anger. And Lord, we, you know it's all understandable. It all makes sense. It's all justified in a way. But it's not the best way. And so, Lord, we pray that you would increase our trust, that even when we're like Paul and we feel like we are despairing of life itself, at that point, we say, this is too much, more than I can endure, and we would still trust you. And we would just allow you to carry us those times. Lord, we pray that Good things are ahead for our country and our world. But Lord, whatever it is, we trust you. You are the sovereign God that is the basis of our foundation underneath us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody, thanks for coming. Bring a friend day next week. Be sure and invite some people. Let's see you.